Good evening, and we're coming again uh, to gather together and discuss, look at, give thought to uh, the Word of God through the ministry of faith. So we are inviting you to join us this evening and connecting on live stream where we can be together and look at really a new series that will take us into the season of Advent. For quite some time, we studied Psalm 119. After all, there are 176 verses in Psalm 119. That was a rich study. But as we introduced last week, if you were looking online or uh, joining us by live stream last Wednesday evening, we introduced the subject of the analogy of faith, John Wesley's view and really his pattern for reading and understanding Scripture. We'll refresh our memories about that in just a moment, but tonight we're going to be looking at a specific passage of Scripture found in Matthew chapter 7, verses 7 through 29. It's the conclusion of the Sermon on the Mount, and we're going to apply John Wesley's analogy of faith to these verses. And you'll catch on. I think you'll understand where we're headed as we make further explanation. But before we do that, I do want to remind you that these are challenging days, which we're aware of that, but these are also very, very rewarding days, and these are days of tremendous opportunity. And I know that we might get discouraged from watching the news. I know that we might at times become very upset with what we see as the trajectory even of our culture and of our political world, but I want you to focus on something differently, and I want to share this with you this evening. These days are also marvelous days of opportunity, especially with people hopeless as they are, fearful as they are. These are openings for us. These are opportunities for us to understand where God wants to use us and to be placed in those crossroads moments of people's lives to be used of Him to help someone come to Christ. So during the month of October in particular, as we see harvesting taking place around us, this is also a harvest time for us. It's a harvest time for the kingdom. And remember, the harvest is plentiful, so the, the harvest productivity is not the problem. It's, it's whether or not we have active laborers. So I want to encourage you as your pastor, or wherever you are, joining us by live stream, understand that, yes, these are challenging days, and in some respects, discouraging days. But as I heard just the other day, I, I, I liked this quote, rather than lament the darkness, light a candle, be a light. So rather than just lament the darkness, light a candle, be a light. These are opportunities that are afforded us by God. Prepare your heart, ask God to use you, and ask God to plant you in someone's path where you can give a reason for the hope you have in Jesus Christ. I want to challenge you with that, and I hope that you will begin to see the reward of what it's like to serve God in days where people are looking at the condition of the world and are understandably fearful and hopeless. And the fact that Jesus is indeed, and always has been, the answer to that great void. So I want to encourage you in that and just urge you to be at work. I would delight in hearing your stories. If God gives you an opportunity, and I believe He will, let me know text me or send me an email or call me and let me know God gave me an opportunity to talk to someone. It was a wonderful moment. It was unexpected. It was a blessing to my own heart, and I'm thankful God gave me the opportunity. I want to hear from you, and I believe if we work together in this era, in this time, for such a time as this, I believe God is going to use us in our immediate area and even among our family members if they need Jesus. God's going to give us an opportunity, and we'll see a harvest. So I want to encourage you in that 
uh, as well. Also, I know that we are dealing with sickness. I know that we're still dealing with COVID. My, oh my, we would not have thought that we were still going to be so affected by COVID, and it would be so defining of life for us. But while that's the case, I want you to know the doors are open, and we are still gathering in person. We have a large enough of a sanctuary where I believe with all of my heart that it's safe to come together and worship in person. There's nothing like it. We're thankful for live stream. We're thankful for that technology, but it's secondary. It's a distant second to actually being here in person. So pray about that. Don't be overcome by fear, and don't be defined by fear. Trust in the Lord, and I encourage you to give thought to being in the place of worship, and don't become comfortable outside of the house of the Lord. So I want to strongly urge you to give consideration to that. Those are the uh, announcements that I want to share. Perhaps one more. The Lord willing, this Sunday morning, we will have with us Mark and Susanna Bev Donahue. They, uh, they are ministering in um, South America, and we are supporting them and their home on uh, home missionary assignments. So they are back raising support, visiting churches, coming before those who are already supporting them and those who will begin to support them. And they're going to be with us, Lord willing, this coming Sunday morning. They will be sharing with us what God has been doing in their lives and in the ministry that He's given them. They will also be sharing um, a wonderful, I'm sure, what will be a wonderful piano duet uh, during our worship time. So they'll be speaking to us. They'll also be blessing us musically. They're going to be also visiting with our youth Sunday school class and also ministering to faith kids. So we look forward to that, and I want to prepare you for that. Even if you're not able to join us, but you do join us by live stream, you can give. And I want to encourage you to give in support of this fine couple in the work that God has called them to do. So remember that for this coming Sunday. All right, let's share a word of prayer, and then we will get into the Scripture, remind ourselves of what the analogy of faith means, and commence with our study. Gracious Father, thank You for this opportunity. We know it is a gift from You. May we not waste it. May it benefit us. And we pray that our study will enrich our devotion and will enliven our spirit. And we pray that we will be further animated by Your Word. May we derive more meaning than we ever have before from Your truth as we apply these means to understand it better and to apply it by Your help and grace. So minister to us, we pray, and encourage us and urge us on and forward in the most holy faith. We praise You for this moment. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's look then at Matthew chapter 7, remember this is the closing of the Sermon on the Mount, and let's pick up the reading with verse 7. Ask, and it will be given you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And he who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. Or what man is there among you who, when his son asks for a loaf, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, he will not give him a snake, will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask Him? In everything, therefore, treat people the same way you want them to treat you, for this is the law and the prophets. Enter through the narrow gate, for the gate is wide and the way is broad that leads to destruction, and there are many who enter through it. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life, and there are few who find it. 
Beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from the thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then, you will know them by their fruits. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name cast out demons and in your name perform many miracles? And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and acts on them may be compared to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and slammed against that house. And yet it did not fall, for it had been founded on the rock. Everyone who hears these words of mine and does not act on them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and slammed against that house. And it fell, and great was its fall. When Jesus had finished these words, the crowds were amazed at His teaching, for He was teaching them as one having authority and not as their scribes. The analogy of faith, John Wesley wanted to help his people better understand and more fully apply the Word of God. Wesley unquestionably loved the Word of God, treasured it, cherished it, never considered that it had any other source than the full inspiration of the Holy Spirit as a special revelation from God to us. So, Wesley was thoroughly biblical. There was never a question about the fact that Wesley also believed that Scripture was absolutely the authoritative Word of God for all matters pertaining to faith and for salvation. There wasn't any question to that. Wesley completely believed that Scripture was always and remained so fully and equally inspired. But he also recognized that there were portions of Scripture that were not as equally important or meaningful, especially areas that would have been somewhat dry and would have been more a recounting of genealogies, things of that nature, but it was equally inspired. So Wesley fully believed in the inspired, authoritative Word of God. Now, one of the things also that Wesley asserted that I believe we need to appreciate is he believed thoroughly that because God never changes and because God is a God of truth, And when he speaks, truth always comes forth from him, and he never needs to amend that truth because God is omniscient. Then he believed this, we should not ever go to the Scriptures with a preconceived notion and just look for a proof text here or there to support our our pre-existing thought. The Bible is not to be used in a proof text kind of way. Rather, we are to go to the Word of God and mine from it what it is saying, and one of the, one of the ways that we will uh, understand the workings of God is to be aware of the fact that God, who is all truth, always speaks truth, is always consistent in His truth, time immemorial, will always speak in a way, Old Testament through the New Testament, in a consistent pattern of truth. So because of that, because of, a, uh, because of patterns that are consistent in God's Word, Wesley believed this. If we came across a passage of Scripture that might uh, be a little bit difficult for us to grasp or it's something that kind of mystifies us a little bit, 
the best light that we can bring to that kind of darkened passage or that um, passage that needs more illumination would be other Scripture. That Scripture is the best tool to help us understand obscure Scriptures because of the fact that Wesley believed there are undeniable patterns in Scripture. So if we wonder about a certain text, bring other Scriptures to it and let those be illuminations, flashlights, lights of some sort or another to help us understand that text. He developed then a series of some brief questions that if we will employ them and bring them to the Scripture that we read, will help us get more out of the text than what we would if we just read over it. So that's what I want us to consider tonight and going forward through the season before Advent. We will look at different Scriptures and employ this method of asking certain questions of the text so that we let it come to life more and by the help of the Holy Spirit understand its depth and its meaning and its moral application. I've, I've uh, quoted before A.W. Tozer, that Tozer reminds us of the fact that we should never ever read the Scriptures for simple information, but we should always read the Scriptures for moral application. So we don't just read so that we know more or have more in our heads about the Word of God. That's not reason enough to read Scripture. Scripture is to always be given the amen from us, which is, may it be so in us. It is the desire for the Word of God to be applied in our lives. So, applying the analogy of faith will help us do that. So, here's a refresher on the questions that we mentioned last week. First, when we read a text, <clears throat> we should ask the question, what, if anything, does this say about God? What does it say about God to us? Second, what does it say about the human condition, especially sin? What does this text say to us about that? Third, what does it say about God's redemptive work or, or justification by faith or the new birth? What does this passage say to us about that? Fourth, what does this passage speak to us or what does it say about sanctification or the whole idea of inward and outward, present inward and outward holiness. So what does it say about sanctification and present inward and outward holiness? Is God calling us in that text to inward and outward holiness? And if it is there, what, what's the light we are getting? What is the application we should be making? And last... Because Wesley believed the aim of the preaching is always love out of a pure heart, taken from the Apostle Paul's inspired writing, and because Jesus, when asked about the summary of what's the best or what's the greatest commandment, said, this is the greatest commandment, you shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and the second is like it, your neighbor as yourself. And on these two hang all the law and the prophets. So what does this text tell us about perfect love or the perfection of love. So those are the questions that form Wesley's analogy of faith, the template or the matrix for looking at a passage of Scripture. I think we will marvel and we will benefit greatly from asking these questions of the text. So let's jump in and get our feet wet a little bit in the application or the use of this analogy of faith to the text that we just read. So let me just highlight a few things. This will not be comprehensive, but I trust it will be a catalyst to get us to think this way and apply this analogy of faith. So what does this text say about God? Well, just from the memory that we have of going back through this great sermon, the last part of this great Sermon on the Mount, one of the first things that came to mind and immediately struck me when asking the question, what does this say about God, was this. Jesus refers to God not in some austere, distant uh, way, not in a cold, static way, but He refers to God in a deeply intimate, familial way. 
And I want us to note that. What he does is he says, this, gro- this God, this great God is our Father in heaven. You don't get a clearer or you don't get a greater or more intimate representation of who God is than that one. So what does Jesus say about God? He is your heavenly Father. What a wonderful family, intimate expression of who God is. He also says about this God that He's a God who gives good gifts to those who ask. Now, that is just a wonderful help to understand who God is. God's not some tyrannical ogre that we ought to run around cowering in the corner thinking is about to blast us. He's a good God who has as His first impulse to give good gifts to those who ask Him. Oh, I hope that helps our hearts this evening. To elaborate more, He rewards those who seek Him. What a promise. If you seek, what does He say? You'll just be frustrated. You'll look and look and look and never find Me. No, if you seek, you will find. He gives great detail to that. He who seeks finds. He who knocks, it'll be opened. And he who asks will receive. So, He's a Father to us. He's our Heavenly Father. He gives good gifts to those who ask Him. And if we seek Him and pursue Him, we find Him, the door is open to us, and we receive what we ask. Now, that isn't in the sense that God just becomes kind of a cosmic errand boy for us. The implication is clear. If you ask according to His will, if you get in step with Him, He's a rewarder of those who seek Him. What a great truth. Here's something else, though, that He says about God, and we need to pay attention to this. He expects us to do His will. The very fact that God, through Jesus and through this sermon, reminds us of that very thing, that He expects us to do His will, it also means we can do His will. So in the positive sense, we can do the will of God, and He expects us to do so. Not only does He expect us to do so, but He provides the grace. He provides the energy. He, pro- he provides the help. He equips us to do what His will includes and involves. Another fact that we need to pay attention to about God is He knows our hearts. You cannot hoodwink Him. You cannot deceive Him. We need to be reminded of that. So what's on the surface and what we try to do and what we might think are uh, notching our gun on a lot of good acts and a a lot of good deeds and we're accomplishing all these things, somehow earning His favor, that doesn't in any way deceive God. God looks at the heart. So He's always interested in what's going on in our hearts. Even if we do what appears on the surface to be good things, good deeds, kind things, etc., those are never sufficient if our hearts are not in league with Him. If our hearts are not obeying God out of a motive of love, God knows that. So let me just remind us of the fact. You can't fool God. God knows our hearts. So this text reminds us of that. And last, one of the things that I would just mention about God is He has requirements for each of us. They're fair. We can perform them. We can bring them. There are conditions we can meet, but there are conditions and requirements, nonetheless, that He expects us to fulfill. God won't just be the one who is always giving. You know, we have become a taker culture. We just take, 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 take. We have expectations that they are known as entitlements. We have the concept that we deserve all of this. We should have all of this. There's no question about that. We should just get everything we want, and we are very, very disappointed and dissatisfied when we don't. 
But in this text and in the conclusion of the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus makes it very clear, God has requirements of us, and we need to fulfill them. Okay, so what does it say about God, all those things that I've mentioned? What does it say about sin in the human condition and and human beings who are affected by sin? Well, here's one of the saddest truths that Jesus ever preached. Many prefer the wide open gate and the broad way that leads to destruction. That's probably one of the saddest summaries that we could ever hear about the human condition that Jesus utters in this sermon. And it's, it's just it's kind of abrupt, it's short in its length, brief in its summary, but powerful. The fact is, it's interesting to me that we kind of think Jesus must not have either known this or didn't mean this, but He did. He said this, here's the reality. The gate is wide open, it's big, it's, it's easy access, and the way is just as broad and accommodating as it can possibly be, but its end, its conclusion, is destruction. My, what a powerful statement. Then he also says we should be ready for this fact, this reality. False prophets are all over the place. Every generation, even when he was incarnate on this earth, he is saying this when he's present with us. So if we think about the, you know, if we think about, oh, it must have been better days when Jesus was here. No, they're just like where we are today. So even while Jesus was here, even while the Son of God was fulfilling the messianic call to come to this earth in human form, in the flesh, Jesus said, false prophets are all over the place. False prophets are abound. And I'm here to tell you, false prophets indeed do abound. But what he says is, they'll look like sheep. They might even bah a little bit. They'll look like sheep, but inside they are ravenous wolves. They are wolves in sheep's clothing. That's where that adage comes from. So you can imagine if they are wolves acting like or wanting to camouflage themselves as if they are sheep, then what we can count on is they will prey on the sheep. If they want to look like sheep, it's so that other sheep will accept them into their fold or the flock. But inside, they're wolves. They're predators. They prey on unwitting sheep. So Jesus says, beware of the fact that false prophets are all over the place. They have their own predatorial purposes. But he says this. I'm I'm, I'm grateful for this. I'm glad for this. He says this. He gives us a, a fairly lengthy, as far as this whole text is concerned, he spends quite a bit of time talking about good trees, good fruit, bad trees, bad fruit, and the two don't mix. A good tree can't produce bad fruit, and a bad tree can't produce good fruit. So he says that to say this, finally to us, you'll look at the fruit. The fruit will be consistent with the character of the tree. Okay, this is on the heels of dealing with false prophets, wolves in sheep's clothing. In other words, thank God we won't be or don't have to be deceived by them because we can discern who and what they are by their fruits. Now, aren't you thankful for that? We can discern what they're like by the fruit we witness in their lives. Now, what does this say then about justification by faith and the new birth? Or what does this say just about the spiritual redemptive work that God wants to do? Well, one of the things that it says is this. This is my paraphrase, of course, but it's this. Talk is cheap because Jesus says, it is only he who does the will of my Father who will enter. Who will enter? So, friends, talk is cheap. But the other factor that I want 
us to consider positively is this. We can enter into the kingdom. Now, we must not miss that opposite. Yes, there's the negative of those who try to talk a good game, try to uh, highlight all that they've done. They won't enter. But the good news for the obedient and for those who are doing the will of God is this, we can enter. So we thank God for that promise. Entrance into the kingdom of God is offered to us. And I want to encourage us with that. And therefore, we have then the contrast that Jesus comes down to the conclusion of the sermon. Now, think about this. The conclusion of this masterful sermon comes to this uh, comparison of two very real opposites. He said, if you do what I'm telling you, if you listen to what I'm telling you, now, isn't that encouraging? In other words, we can. We can. If you listen and if you pay attention and if you do what I'm telling you to do, here's what you can count on. You will be like the wise man who built his house on a rock. And even though the rain came down and the floods came up and the wind blew and smashed against that house, it was not moved, it was not destroyed. Why? It was founded on the rock. So, Wonderful cans in this text. First of all, you can enter. Second, you can be wise in an unwise world. Third, you can have security and assurance. You can be like the wise man who built his house on the rock. You can be founded on the rock. So when we elaborate on the rock, remember that Jesus is indeed that rock. He is that foundation. We can be founded on the rock. Praise God. What does this text say about sanctification and present inward and outward holiness? Well, we can look at it this way. Yes, there is a wide open, just chasmic gate. Yes, there is a broad way that it appears all the people around us and the word that we get on the street is everybody's heading in this way. It leads to destruction, but people are choosing it by the score. Yet the contrast is also available and possible. Present inward and outward holiness of life is possible by taking the narrow gate, the small gate, and that way that is narrow. If we do that, if we take that way, we will enter into God's kingdom. For the gate is small and the way is narrow that leads to life. Here in this case, the word life has its most positive connotation in life that is defined by and enabled by the very life giver himself, Jesus Christ. He is life with a capital L. He is light with a capital L. He is love with a capital L. Now here's the staggering fact about this that we need to let sober us. There are few who find it. It doesn't mean because it's so elusive. It doesn't mean because it's hard to figure out. It doesn't mean because it's so mysterious and it's so shrouded that there are few that find it. It's not like finding it because it's like a needle in a haystack. That's not the issue. The issue is few will do what is necessary. Few will humble themselves and go against the flow of humankind, culture, society. Few will pay the price to enter. It's just a reality. Jesus says this is just the reality. So friends, 
If you're a seeker after the heart of God, if you're a pursuer of God, just recognize this from the get-go. The world, in a broad way and in an overwhelming numerical way, will be going the opposite direction. They'll make fun of you. They'll probably look at you and think you're strange. They'll mock you. They'll think you're a fanatic. You'll find that there isn't a lot in that kind of a mainstream and broad stream direction. There isn't much out there, if anything, to help you go the way that you know you're called to go. But the fact is, if, if you go that way, which means also you can, if you choose holiness of heart and life, present inward and outward holiness, God will equip you, and there isn't anyone greater than God, God will equip you and give you the wherewithal to live as you ought to live. He'll live in you through His Spirit. He'll give you the Spirit of Jesus Himself, and He'll lead you in the way that is eternal and everlasting and that brings you into the kingdom. You can, you can, you can. It doesn't mean it'll be popular. It doesn't mean that you'll have a lot of support along the way from even family members. But the fact is, you can you can, even though there are few that find it, and that's a sobering reality, you can find it nonetheless. So I'll close then with this. What does this tell us about perfect love? Well, there probably isn't any better verse in this context and in this Scripture that speaks of that than verse 12. We know it as the golden rule. It's, it's worded a little different in the New American Standard here, but let's read it. In everything, therefore... Treat people the same way you want them to treat you, for this is the law and the prophets, the golden rule. So, think about this. We have just covered the conclusion of one of the, well, the greatest sermon ever preached, the Sermon on the, on the Mount. And by looking at what this says about God, what it says about sin and the human condition, and what it says about justification by faith and the new birth, what it says about um, present inward and outward holiness, sanctification, and what it says about the perfection of love, we have looked at this text and I believe gained far greater insight through applying this analogy of faith. So, I challenge you, I urge you, to take on what I believe could be, really could be, one of the most revolutionizing tools for your Bible reading that you could ever employ. Remember, Wesley wanted his people to know the book. And so he devised this means that he believed God gave him to give them so that when they read Scripture, they, they could mine from it all of the gems and all the precious metals that are contained in it. And I want you to do the same. So that's why I'm giving this to you, and that's why over the next few weeks we will be looking at some Scriptures, employing this method, and the purpose of that is to get you in the habit of applying the analogy of faith. All right, that concludes at least our study tonight. I trust that you benefited from what we did this evening. Take notes, write things down, and if you, if, you want, uh, if you want me to elaborate on those points, I'll be glad to do so with you, but I'll continue to give you those five questions over and over again that we can ask of the Scripture. I'll do that for you as we go through this study. Now, let's highlight some prayer requests before we conclude. We continue to remember the individuals who are associated with us or connected to us in one way or the other who are dealing with COVID. And boy, it just has hit again uh, pretty hard. And we have a number of people that have come down with COVID and are recovering, some recovering more quickly than others, and we have folks to remember. So I want, to, I want us to pray for Jean and Miriam Mason, and I want us to, to remember uh, Pastor Mel Truex. He is dealing with COVID. Uh, pray for Jim McCreary as he's in Crestview. He's also dealing with COVID. Uh, we, we just want to remember all these individuals who are coming out of that. We want to remember and pray for uh, Ron Van Dyke, and we're, we're praying for Tim and Judy Mason. 
um, Warner Mathias, a number of individuals who have been dealing with COVID and we're praying for them to recover and heal completely. Then we do have uh, a need that we did not get printed or po posted yet on our prayer request. It came to us a little bit later this afternoon. Uh, David Case's wife, Sally, Sally Case, fell and um, indeed has um, a fracture uh, in her pelvis. And so we want to pray for her. Um, she won't be seeing an orthopedic uh, surgeon until a week from today. So we need to pray for Sally as she's medicated and, and resting. And then as David said, pray for him as he tries to be a better nurse. So remember that. Remember Kitty Katora, who is recovering from um, her uh, hip surgery. Just pray for a complete and thorough and uh, seamless healing and recovery for her. We have a number of individuals who have lost loved ones, and those are listed folks that we need to remember in that regard as well. Then we're praying for, remember, five of our faith kids a week. Those of our children who are in faith kids, we love them dearly. We're praying for them every week. We have five new names for this week to remember. Lydia, Malachi, Maria, Mara, Maisie. And we're praying for these precious young people. We love our children. We thank the Lord that at faith we have a lot of children. And we have uh, babies that are about to be born. And we have, you know, with, the, with uh, wonderful expansions to families and our broader church family. So we're just thankful for young adults, for young families, for children, and for the ministry of Pastor Jared to them. So we want to remember these five precious lives. And then we're praying, when we think about that, for PDHC, Pregnancy Decision Health Center. They do a masterful job of, and a wonderful, just loving heart job of ministering to individuals who find themselves in a pregnancy that they didn't expect and are, con are, are considering abortion. And they're on the front lines to urge them. God loves them. Means are available. Resources are available to help support this precious gift of life. So we, we're thankful for PDHC. Then, as well, we're praying for our Church, district, and denominational leadership, these are challenging days. We need to be true to the Word of God. We need to be faithful in our leadership. While we love God, we want to make sure that we tell people the truth because that's the only way we really truly express we love them is we give them the truth and the Word of God. We need to pray for our missions endeavors and for all that is taking place around the world to reach people for Jesus. So let's share a word of prayer, and then we'll conclude our time together. Gracious God, sometimes the needs just overwhelm us, and we look at all of them, we read them, we see the names, and we see the issues, and we easily just get overwhelmed by what appears to us to be just a mounting, mounting need. But Father, You are able to meet the needs no matter how many, or varied or vast, you are able to meet all of our needs. So, Father, with glad hearts tonight and with confidence, and also with a deep sense of peace and comfort, we commit our brothers and sisters to you, many who are recovering from COVID or other illnesses. We think also of Noah Akers, who is dealing, Father, with cancer and is especially struggling today in the hospital, these who you know and you love and you care for them, Father, they're connected to us. We love them too. We just pray for them, for your presence to move in and into their hearts and their minds and the circumstance they face. And we're just trusting you to do all that you have promised you will do, to be our Father, to, to love your children as your Word declares. And we know you do. We pray for all the help that you can bring to the need and to the setting. You are able to do far beyond what we can imagine. We thank you, Lord, for the ministries that you've brought our way to connect and to partner with these ministries. Op Operation Christmas Child, Foundation Dinners, Maywood Mission, 
PDHC, all of these wonderful ministries that are doing a fine work in the name of Jesus and through His love to care for people and their specific needs. Thank you, Lord, for these entities, these leaders, and these folks that are serving as you've called them. We think of our missionaries as well and pray your blessing upon them. Give them, Father, wonderful days of harvest where they are serving. We pray as well for our own denominational leadership, district leadership, the leadership of this congregation and our people. We commit the work of your church, Jesus, to you. And may you do in and us and through us what you so long to do. May your church be faithful today for such a time as this. May we be faithful for our watch. May we be on call. May we do the work. And may your kingdom be built, and added to, because of the faithfulness of your people and the help of your spirit. So, Lord, we just commit all of this to you tonight. Thank you for the peace that we find in you. Peace that passes understanding. Heal our land. Redeem those who are lost. Speak truth where we believe, Father, the lie has abounded for a long time. Overcome evil with good. And do so through us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, God bless you. I encourage you, as I always do, keep the faith. Don't believe everything you hear on the news. Remember this. Just like John, who preached a great message known as the Revelation, concluded his time by saying this, even so, even so, come, Lord Jesus. So keep the faith. Be encouraged. Be useful for the kingdom of God. And may God bless you in the going. Good to be with you. Keep the faith.